gonna first start by going to the rink um, and showing where my home is and where I feel comfortable and where I feel confident. And then we will be going around to different locations across Yale's campus uh, to see different professionals, um, mostly MD, PhD um, professionals who have a very amazing career that they've uh, developed and seeing where their research is taking them. So given that I've spent my whole entire life as a skater, um, I think my exposure to fields outside of skating has been quite limited. So I'm really excited today to, to get to explore new fields, get to explore new ideas and thoughts and um, hopefully just get some inspiration to, uh, to understand what it is exactly that I want to do in the future. We are excited to show Nathan some ongoing biomedical research, show why it is important, how it may one day treat disease and save lives. How did you develop that discipline? Like, did you just kind of learn it? Did your parents mentor you, family, your coaches? Like, yeah. what village helped right. you become Nathan Chen, you know, world famous ice skater? <laughs> yeah, I mean, as you said, it's a village, right? And yeah. I think it started with definitely my parents. Um, and I think they just like have the intent that, you know, no matter what, doesn't matter how far we, we take our, our hobbies or our careers, as long as we try our very best to do as best as we can every day and try to improve every single day. Um, and that was sort of the mentality that I had with the ice. Physician scientists make up about 1.5% of all doctors in the U.S. and they help push forward understanding, prevention, and treatment of disease by doing both research and clinical work. Yeah, I've, I've, been, I've had the pleasure to be able to work with uh, um, physician scientists uh, over the past couple months. Um, and it's just, uh, it's been really eye-opening and uh, very inspiring to be able to see uh, the work that's being done and realize that while you know, clinicians are doing amazing things and helping helping patients. Um, there's a whole whole uh, world out there of, of possibility uh, that physician scientists are trying to uh, encapsulate on and help continue to progress medicine uh, in a way that it currently isn't. So I think that's really inspiring, and you know, it's uh, uh, definitely a career path that I think um, I have opened my eyes to. Here are some scientists and physician scientists working to tackle these conditions. Engineering here, and um, yeah, I'm just going to show you a little bit about engineered heart tissue and talk a bit about what we use it for. Okay, so I don't know if you can see that, but there's that yeah. little web that goes across wow. there. Yeah. That is is a little engineered heart tissue wow. uh, with human heart cells growing on it. We are using it to evaluate different drugs that are targeted towards specifically treating. Um, genetic forms of, of heart disease. So that's that's a big application that we want to see. Maybe even more exciting is the fact that we can create tissues from specific patients and try to unravel the origins of their particular um, cardiac disorders. So basically what I want to do is try to study that uh, in a dish using engineered heart tissue so we can try to come up with new therapies and treatments. My project this year is working um, using our engineered heart tissues as a model for human hearts to investigate how a certain heart failure drug can be optimized to have different combinations of dosages and timings to produce the best results. And so today what we'll do is I'll show you how to process some uh, blood samples. For many of our experiments, we collect blood from patients into these tubes. And so what this machine does is that it spins the blood or the tubes and it'll help us separate uh, the different components of the blood. So once you've accumulated all this data, what are the next steps uh, with this data? Um, we can use this data for diagnosing patients' condition. We can um, look at the different markers and see what treatments may be able to help, um, you know, either lower some of the markers or improve uh, the function uh, of these cells. Each dot represents an individual cell. 
And so we can categorize these cells based on uh, you know, the markers that are expressed uh, into these different populations. Uh, for example, many of these are cytokines, and cytokines are involved in inflammatory processes. So if you have an infection or if there's an autoimmune disease, these can be elevated. So it could be a good indicator of these conditions. Dr. Jennifer Kwan is a physician scientist at Yale School of Medicine, specializing in cardio-oncology which is a specialty that helps to manage and prevent cardiotoxicity associated with cancer therapy. She also studies the biology of single cells and genomics and leverages cardiac imaging to understand how they can affect and predict health and disease states. We've been working with each other now for, for a couple months. And I just wanted to give you a little bit more background in terms of one uh, of the bigger areas of the lab. Uh, which is looking at this condition called clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential, or the short uh, name for it or acronym is CHIP. And so this condition is a disease of aging. So as people get older, they're more likely to develop it. Why is it important? So CHIP has been shown to double the risk of heart disease. It also has been shown to increase the risk of heart failure, both due to heart disease as well as non-heart disease. It also has been shown to increase the risk of developing blockages in the blood vessels that supply your legs and your arms. So we're trying to understand what could be those potential mechanisms. We see in our own patients here at Yale in a heart failure group that the patients without CHIP survive better compared to the patients with CHIP. And this has been shown in other studies as well. In addition to looking at the known CHIP genes, we've also expanded that uh, search to other genes as well that have been more shown to be more prevalent in heart failure patients. So HF stands for heart failure, non HF is non heart failure patients using the top med cohort. The heart failure patients actually have a much higher burden of these somatic variants, meaning that the gene sequence gets changed in not the not the DNA sequence that they were born with, but over time, our cells can acquire these mutations and usually it goes up with as we age. So that's kind of some of the research that you've been getting involved with is understanding what kind of effect do these gene variants that are not the gene sequence that we were born with, but have acquired that we have acquired over time that's circulating in our blood, how, how can that impact heart disease? How can that impact heart failure? And so that's what we're trying to understand. One very useful tool that physician scientists have is big data sets. So when they looked at that patient population, they actually uh, found that the patients who preferentially benefited from suppressing the inflammatory cytokine called IO-1 beta with, with one of their antibody drugs, that significantly reduced uh, future heart attacks. Uh, future death, heart death, uh, compared to the patients who did not get that drug. And interestingly, in that study, the patients who had CHIP preferentially benefited from that drug even more. So there is evidence that you could potentially reduce the risk of heart disease, heart failure in CHIP patients. So it seems that like being, being able to be a physician and a scientist allows you to do really cutting edge and like brand new novel uh, research exactly. and, and information gathering. It's yep. So yeah, that's the beauty of being in that, straddling those two worlds, uh, being able to see the clinical problems that affect your patients, or even see the problems where you know they're, they're affecting the patients and where we currently don't have any therapies for. For CHIP, even though it doubles the risk of heart disease, we currently do not have any established guidelines to monitor them, and there are no approved therapies to treat these patients. So we are using um, cardiac magnetic resonance imaging and we are um, basically um, integrating over space and time to produce, to, to be able to understand the spatial and temporal patterns that characterize the uh, conditions such as CHIP in the human heart. Dr. David Braun is a physician scientist in oncology at Yale School of Medicine who studies what makes immunotherapy work in cancer preventing its toxicities and is working to improve its cancer-fighting effects. 
we actually, uh, you know, through their generosity, get their tumor material, get blood, get other material, so we can actually study how their cancer develops, how it potentially grows, if it does respond to treatment, why that is, and unfortunately, if it doesn't respond to treatment, why that is. So can you explain a little bit more about what exactly is immunotherapy? It's not new. It's the idea of using your own immune system to try to fight cancer. The cancers figure out ways to actively escape or evade from the immune system. While there's been little inroads here and there, really the past 10 years has been a transformative experience where it went from a, a theory, a concept, to something that is actually helping you know, thousands, if not tens of thousands of patients worldwide. And for patients with advanced cancer, really providing hope. Even for some patients with very advanced cancers, cancers that have spread throughout the body or metastatic cancers, some of those patients are cured with immunotherapy, something that would have been unheard of 10 or 15 years ago but still the minority of patients. And so how can we understand when things go right, what's going on, but also in the majority of patients where it ultimately doesn't work, can we figure out what are those ways that the, the drugs just aren't getting there and how can we come up with version two and version three to, to improve upon it? And currently immunotherapy seems to be a very uh, good approach to, to treating cancer, uh, but what sort of side effects might come about with immunotherapies and what are things that you're trying to do to reduce those side effects? We think of this generation as really releasing the brakes. But you can imagine when you're just releasing the brakes without a steering wheel, you hope that the immune system steers towards and targets cancer and it doesn't target other normal parts of the body. But we know that's not always the case. We know that sometimes it doesn't attack the cancer and we don't have the effect we want to have. Or sometimes it's overactive and it attacks other organs in the body. And when it does that, that's why we get the immune related side effects. And some are more common, some are less common, but can be anywhere from head to toe, really. Anywhere from you know, severe inflammation of the brain, to the heart, to the lungs, to the bowels, and anywhere in between. So if we move from just that general releasing the brakes, can we figure out when things go right, when the immune system really works and targets and clears cancer, what is it recognizing on the tumor specifically? What is it recognizing on those cancer cells? And can we use that to actually design more custom or personalized therapies that will be that steering wheel to help really direct the immune system to attack the cancer and hopefully only the cancer? So um, in 1990s, Congress, US Congress decided to um, sequence the human genome. And uh, the idea was that all the secrets will be known as well as then we will be able to know what goes wrong when there is a disease and then we can find the cure. So this center, as I mentioned, has identified so many genes for cardiovascular disease, cancers, skin disorders, kidney diseases, you can name it. And one of the reasons is that we collaborate the combination of the genome facility and the top scientist at Yale. That makes us so successful. Nathan meets with the new Dean of Data Scientist at Yale physician scientist, Dr. Lucille Anomachar. As I'm in data science, what do you think will be sort of, what are the most exciting uh, um, aspects of data science and what are things that you think will, how, how do you think the field of data science is going to continue evolving in the next many years? I think in, in medicine in particular, uh, medicine has always uh, tried to be evidence-based, but with more data, in, uh, new data modalities such as uh, genome, whole, whole genomes, in uh, other kinds of new uh, data, we will be able to more and more personalize medicine to a uh, level that we weren't able before. How are you going about um, ensuring that there is diversity in data and in diversity in the, in the field of data science in itself? Which is that we want to have more data from more diverse populations. And, and that's at the crux of the problem. So in various projects, such as one uh, named All of Us Research Program funded by the NIH, the whole purpose is to ensure that we have wide representation. Physician scientists have given us insulin, vaccines, new cancer and heart disease therapies. What else will they bring us in the future? It's really cool to be actually to be able to be working with you um, and seeing the data science application uh, to healthcare and, and genomics, um, as well as you know being able to experience a lot of these uh, the different uh, avenues of medicine. It's been really enlightening, and uh, I've really enjoyed a lot of the oncology uh, sort of lectures or presentations that I've been able to see. And I think that's something that still has uh, continued or that has sort of continued um, inspiring me. Where do you foresee yourself going uh, with some of your research endeavors? I think right now definitely is just to get more experience and get more knowledge, get some of the hard skills needed to uh, accomplish 
whatever goals might be there for me in the future. But I'm really lucky to be able to have the opportunity to work on uh, the, the, the research that you're currently doing. Um, and uh, excited to you know, continue, learning, continue learning more about the project as well as figuring out how to, again, develop the hard skills to be able to accomplish a project like this. You see insights from seeing patients. You see the challenges that they face and the problems that they have. And so you're able to go back to the lab and say, like, can I help address this question? You, know, you, you have clinically relevant questions that you can take back to the lab and try to do some experiments, or you take it back to your database and say, is that, you know, is that gene variance associated with this heart disease or heart failure uh, that, that we see in, in this patient that I saw in clinic? So you're able to go back and try to ask those questions and try to do research to try to answer that question for your patient. And if you lose them, you may never come up with that, you know, with the new therapies or prevention strategy for heart disease and heart failure or cancer. This career has challenges, but also potentially very rewarding and absolutely necessary for society and, and humanity if we are to continue to make progress in addressing human disease and allowing us to live happier and healthier and longer lives. Nathan Chen uh, is very popular amongst everyone we met. Uh, everyone wanted a photo with him and uh, also uh, some of the hospital staff was very excited to meet him. Many of them said that that made, his, made their day. So it's like he, he has a lot of influence already, even, you know, before he becomes a medical student, before he becomes a, a physician, he's already had a lot of positive influence. So I'm sure we'll continue to be able to do that as a doctor and, and beyond. How can we support the research they do? Go to the link below to support. Make a tax deductible donation and type in Dr. Jennifer Kwan's research. So I think basically we started the genomic era and then also we started the precision medicine era. So you know what is precision medicine? I should definitely tell you, this is very exciting. So at that time, it was very well known, only 10% of the melanoma patients responded to chemotherapy, 90% didn't. Nobody knew the reason. So when we sequenced these 300 melanoma patients, we, we realized that, oh my God, the melanoma is not caused by just one defect in one gene, but there are other genes. And fair enough, the the drug was acting only in one of those genes, not the other. So that explained that the drug was effective because it was specifically targeted to that particular and the others didn't respond. So, so this is the basic idea about precision medicine. So uh, the, the current medicine is like one shoe fits all. See, we are all different people. We are individual people. We are wearing different sizes of shoes. But the current medicine ex understand, um, assumes that we are all wearing the same. But you are different, I am different, Jennifer is different because we are all different color, different body, different way of thinking, liking, everything is different. Genetically, we are all human beings identical 99.9%. But there is something beyond that now. So you might have heard the new technique called CRISPR. Have you? Yeah, well, I'm well familiar. My sister um, works, uh, my sister worked for Jennifer Doudna. Oh, really? uh, in her lab, actually, oh, yeah. Wow. So she was, part of, she was part of her team. Uh, we work with trying to prevent uh, uh, blood clots related to uh, central uh, venous catheters.